Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to the Bible as Literature podcast. Elitist intellectuals are drawn to the concept of a psychological trap because the suffering of others entertains them and because their perception of another's supposed trap reinforces their sense of self-importance and permanence. Poor Sartre, poor DNC, poor Duopoly. The fool says in his heart, there is no judge. I agree, Jean-Paul. For your spiritual children, there can be no exit. The local Judean elders who should be hearing and repeating Jesus's words are more concerned with manipulating the goodwill of their Roman occupiers to further their political agenda. In turn, the Roman servant, manipulated by the elders, shows zeal for the Torah. Still, his life remains in disrepair because the people of the synagogue love their nation and their shiny new synagogue more than the words, the Debarim of Isaiah. What right do the Judeans have to call anyone worthy or good? Their human judgment, assessment, and feedback build a house that Jesus does not enter and a synagogue that ultimately rejects him. Is there an exit from Sartre's hell? Yes, clearly. French existentialism, like postmodernism, is silly. There is only one judge. <laughs> Stop listening to the people of Capernaum and start following Jesus. Imitate the obedience of the centurion who did not accept accolades from the people of Judea, but received instead the one vote that counts. This week, I discuss Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to episode 541 of the Bible as Literature podcast, Historical Context, when hearing historical fiction writing is of the utmost importance. I have referred often to Father Paul's critical work, The Rise of Scripture, as setting the table for understanding the biblical text. And please also pay attention to what is being said now on Tadazi Tuesdays for hearing once again the situation in which we find ourselves because of the absurdity of the historicization of the biblical text because of a desire to, how can I say this, appease our abusers. Colonialism is not a new idea. If you hear the biblical prophets, it's the same story over and over again. Everyone wants to appease their abuser. Everyone looks to praise and receive the praise of their tormentor. <laughs> and from that cycle of stupidity, there is no exit. 
it's worse than the blind leading the blind. Well, it's the same thing, and you are stuck in a pit. It's worse than Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, people call it Stockholm Syndrome, but it's worse. Because you're not just a poor victim of centuries of anti-Semitism in Europe. You now are the anti-Semite. Are you kidding me? It's a tricky business, this nasty trap of human judgment and human praise and human assessment and human opinion. We give it and we take it in order to manipulate and control. Because we want to further an agenda. We have, as philosopher tyrants, our view of how things should be. But there is no should. There is no outcome. There is no anything. So in the rise of scripture, Father Paul explains that Herod exactly as it says in scripture, wants to be like all the nations. His temple project in Jerusalem was an attempt to gain favor with his Hasmonean supporters. It was a political strategy to appeal to a faction in Judea loyal to the Hasmonean dynasty. In other words, the whole point of levying attacks, and this is the tension, the political tension. This is what Paul is addressing in Galatians, this whole business of circumcision. You took something that God was using to mock the Greeks in the Torah, who elevate the beauty of the human form. I mean, the function of circumcision is to denigrate the worship of the human form. You took this and you made it into your marketing brand so that you could raise a tax to build a temple of stone so that you could build leverage and influence over the Judeans no longer in the neighborhood of Judea within the Roman Empire. This was how you twisted and put into disrepair the teaching of circumcision to secure support for a political agenda and at the same time to do so in a way that was look sucking up to the romans you wanted to be like the romans and the Greeks with big buildings and forums <laughs> and statues. It's plain as day. It's right there. So you have a Roman centurion in the beginning of chapter 7 just on the heels of the mashal, of the empty vessel who doesn't build anything. He simply works with the foundation that was laid by the one who created the heavens and the earth. His name be praised, the only God. Let no man be worshipped. We just heard this parable, which you put in your stewardship brochures. May they all be cursed. On the heels of this parable, we now hear the elders of Judea, these same elders from that neighborhood of people, the people booted Jesus out. These people now come and give their assessment that we have someone who's worthy. They said Jesus was unworthy and now this one is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he loves our nation and he built our building. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? There's something happening here, and what it is, is very clear. Let's hear the text. When he had completed 
Listen, listen to this ridiculous, ridiculous translation, all his discourse. What is this a seminar at Columbia University, the school that targets children who put in your face the truth of your ugliness? It wasn't a discourse. He was teaching the words of his father. Banda afto tarimata istas akoas. His words in the hearing to Lau of the people. He was putting his words, which were the words given to him by his dad, he was putting the words, his words, in the hearing of the people. What do you mean discourse? Yes, I know you can play with language and make your case, but he was putting the debarim of God's instruction in their hearing. This isn't an Ivy League lecture. These are technical terms, and I wish the translations were more technical, but that's an argument long since lost by those who love to make it sound nice. When he had completed all his words in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, and a centurion's slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel, have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Now, there are a couple of things that jump out immediately when you hear this text. The first is this vile statement. It's vile. And this ugly judgment that's made, and I already talked about it, but I want to repeat it because I know it's so normal for human beings to speak this way that unless you've been listening to the podcast for some time, your ears didn't catch it. So let me read it for you again. And scripture is very tricky because it is entrapping you. It weaves it into the approval of Jesus later, but the approval is tricky. So let me just lay it out for you. Listen to this phrase. Listen to how horrible it is. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him. And hear it against the backdrop of what's happening in late antiquity with the sycophancy and the abuse of Herod, who in the biblical text is a villain, mind you. They implored him saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him. I will say it again and again and again. How dare they say that either the centurion or his slave are worthy? How dare they say so? It's like my parishioners who keep telling me that people who work really hard on church projects are good and I should give them accolades. I understand their impulse. They're worried people will leave the parish, that we need parishioners, that we need members and so forth and so on. But they don't understand that they are making functional the wicked of the gospel. To speak this way in God's purview is satanic. He is worthy for you to grant this to him. It is evil speech, technically, in a scriptural, biblical context. 
if this is the synagogue of God, the church of God, if it is his swarm, his flock, you can't speak this way. This pattern of complimenting people at the end of the service is anti-scriptural. And the way that people have constructed their Western liturgies, it's an expectation that the priest or the pastor or the minister would throw out a few compliments at the end. It's sick. He is worthy for you to grant this to him? What are you talking about? When the Lord himself says, no one is good but God alone, in every gospel text. And this next verse, especially in light of current events, where we see the toxicity of ultra nationalism, which everybody was dreaming was erased after World War II. It was never erased. It will never be erased because human beings in their inner secret heart are all extreme nationalists. Listen to verse five. For he loves our nation. Gar agapa imon to ethnos. For he loves our nation. And it was he who ke aftos built okodomisi imin tin sinagogin. It was he who built us our swarm, our synagogue, our gathering. How can you build a gathering? To my scriptural ears, you can't build something that is found. I said it in dark sayings. How can you build? A community. The phrase community building is anti-scriptural. How can you build something that is found? It's not Mr. Rogers' community. <laughs> He's not saying, I'm going to build a neighborhood. He's asking, who is in the neighborhood? There's something there. And the terminology here is functional because the word used for built in verse five is ikodomeo. It's the same term. It's functional with the previous parable because what men build is evil. Bana in Hebrew is evil. Our function is in obedience to God's instruction, which was rejected in Luke chapter four. Remember at the beginning of Luke, God had to silence the priest in the temple, which Herod built because we are interested in the words of Isaiah, not the words of the human speaker. Whoever it is, it doesn't matter. We don't want to hear human wisdom. We want to hear the words of God from his scroll. That's the bottom line. The Bible, friends, is anti-institutional. It is anti-establishment. It is anti-human being. It's not you against the king. It's God against you. You as an individual are an institution. You can't play your games. It is the scriptural words on the move against you. You, O oh man, whoever you are. Because look what happens. Look what happens. Look at the state of things now in our country. So that's the first thing is the insidiousness of the way in which institution tries to co-opt and thus becomes corrupted. You turn the circumcision of God into your marketing brand and thus you cripple and you damage the one whom God sent you to heal. That's part A. Part B is the fact that you are saying the centurion is worthy. You are saying that you think on the basis of your judgment that the anointed one of the most high God should heal this one. Who do you think you are? Now, the second feature that's fascinating in the text is that the centurion himself correctly says, I'm not going to pass judgment on myself. I don't accept their judgment of me. I'm in no position to say that I'm worthy. He sounds like the Apostle Paul, which means that Paul's gospel to the Gentiles reached him despite their machinations. Now there's terminology in the text. That's the key thing. There's terminology in the text that underscores this 
functionality of rejection of the stone, which obviously is the Lord Jesus Christ, this connection also to Paul's teaching of restoration, which is functional with Genesis and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's begin, though, with this connection to the stone which the builders rejected. You have this itinerary of the synagogue in Luke. Luke chapter 4, Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and the people in the neighborhood, his neighborhood, the people that everybody thinks you should listen to, boot him out. Then he returns to a synagogue to scatter the demons. He casts out an unclean spirit. Then, again in Luke chapter 4, we hear that he continues to move throughout the region of Judea, throughout the synagogues, teaching the words of his father, the instruction of the Torah. Then, in Luke chapter 6, he enters the synagogue on the Sabbath and he restores the hand of a man with a withered hand. All right. And again, it's this function of restoration. Restoring what is found to its normal function. And in Matthew, there's even an emphasis that doesn't exist in Luke, that he is restoring the hand of the withered man to normal like the other one. You're not building anything. You are restoring something to its normal function. That is how the creation narrative in Genesis works. You have the tohu wabohu, the rubble, and God is making it functional again after it was raised. Not raised as in raised up, but, you know, after it was raised to the ground, destroyed, came under destruction and desolation. And then... You come now to chapter 7, which is the story that we're hearing about, the mashal of the centurion slave. And then later in Luke 13, Jesus will restore, repair the woman crippled by Satan for 18 years on the Sabbath in a confrontation, once again, with the synagogue, with the swarm, the aida in Hebrew. This reference to the swarm is critical because it's like a flock of animals that's always meant to be moving, not fixed on the land, not something that we construct. Now, the terminology is key here, the lexical terminology, because there is a term that is used sparingly in the New Testament in Greek, entimos, which means held precious, honored. It can be honorable in rank. and rank. This usage has different correspondences in the consonantal Hebrew, but the one that is specific to this particular mashal is yaqar, because it aligns with the usage of this term in 1 Peter. And I want you to hear it. It's very powerful. And coming to him as to a living stone which had been rejected by men, but is choice and precious, entimon in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. It's so beautiful, friends, especially in light of what's happening in Palestine. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious entimon cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. And this is why 
this beautiful Hebrew term is functional that I mentioned. Then Saul said, and here's an example in the text, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you again because my life was precious. Yokra in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. So, yakar, yod, kof, resh in Hebrew can function as heavy, valuable, honored, dignified. But here, the key thing is precious. But the one who is precious is, you know, obviously Paul, whose name was changed from Saul, but ultimately it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the preaching of the Apostle Paul. He is the one who is precious. He is the stone which the builders rejected. And the related Arabic root, waw qaf ra, implies dignity or to honor. Waqar in Arabic means dignity or solemnity. This is what was rejected by your so-called community, by the people in the neighborhood of Jesus' hometown, because they wanted to build something because they love their nation. This is what Luke is telling you. This is what's at stake in the Gospels. It's rejecting nationalism, or what we call nationalism. They wouldn't have used that terminology per se in the classical world. Entimos also appears in Philippians, powerful text. So I also alluded to this question of healing. And the Hebrew term that is lexically connected to the term that is used for healing here in Luke, iathito, is rafa, means to heal or to cure, but importantly, to mend or to repair something. You can say rafa in biblical Hebrew when you're referring to fixing something that was broken. Like you repair a broken door. You can repair, for example, in Jeremiah, a potter's vessel. And that's where this becomes interesting if you make the connection between the slave, if the slave becomes functional with Philippians, this reference to the potter's vessel becomes interesting. In Jeremiah 19, 11, and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, just so will I break this people and this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot again be repaired. Le herafe, which is the same word, it's rafa, and they will bury it in Topheth because there is no other place for burial. Powerful. So it means to heal, but healing in Semitic, it's also true in Arabic, is linked to repairing. You repair something. You restore it to its original function, just as in Matthew and Luke, the man with the withered hand, whom Jesus heals in the synagogue, his hand is restored just like the other one to its original function. That's what's happening in creation. It's not creation ex nihilo. You're not building anything. You're not making anything new. You are restoring. You're making the rubble functional again. And that's why there's hope. Because the one who makes things functional makes it so through the wisdom of his words. And that is the hope for the one who isn't foolish, for the one who trusts that God is the judge. Yalla. Bye. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.